before there was light Walked across the pages of time He who made every living thing Behold him He who heard humanity's cry Left his throne to wake as a child He became like the least of us Behold him Jesus, Son of God, Messiah The Lamb, the roaring lion Oh, be still and behold him Good Sunday morning. Welcome to Cornerstone Community Church. If you're here in the room or if you're joining online, it, what, a, what a good thing to gather together uh, to worship Jesus because he's worthy of our worship. And so receive uh, the welcome of Jesus this morning. Receive welcome from us as a, as a community of his followers. And uh, if you're kind of kicking the tires uh, on Jesus or on his church uh, or on this particular church, uh, we hope you feel a uh, a warm welcome this morning. We would invite you to consider who Jesus is and, um, and think the very best place you can do that is among the people who are devoted to him and who are seeking to follow him and take his word really seriously. And so uh, be welcomed here this morning. My name's Kevin, and uh, I'll be uh, uh, bringing the, the message later on this morning. I get the privilege of being one of the pastors at Cornerstone. And, uh, and as pastors, we'd love to... Uh, to engage with you if you're uh, new around here. And one of the ways in which you can do that is in a couple of weeks, uh, we will be having a, a newcomer's uh, lunch uh, after a service on the, uh, uh, tw- on the 19th. So that's two weeks from today. So you can just hang around after the service um, and you'll have an opportunity to hear about what it looks like to get a little more connected in this community. Um, as pastors, we'll be there and uh, so uh, you do, we do ask that you register online so we can know how many folks are planning on being there. But that's two weeks from today, uh, our newcomer's lunch. One week from today, though, is launch of our kids' ministry. And I'm going to invite our uh, children's ministry program director, Laura Deck, to come and uh, fill us in on what next week will look like. So Sunday, September 12th, is a very countdown-worthy day for many. And that's the day that we relaunch our Cornerstone Kids programming. The rooms are almost set, the curriculum is chosen, and we have over 50 volunteers with still a few gaps needed to be filled. But now all we need are our Cornerstone Kids to occupy the spaces that are over in our kids' wing. So this includes our nursery, our preschool, kindergarten, and large group worship for grades one to six. And of course, our junior youth are grades seven to eight. So Laura, all this information is great and helpful. Are you just reading word for word off the website? And yes, I am, but I do have a next two steps for you. So the first step is that we would love for you to register your kids. And so, kids, when you're getting your popsicles after service, we're actually going to give you a clipboard. You are going to bring that back to your parents, and they're going to sign you up for Cornerstone Kids for this whole year. For those that are at home, you can print that off, and you can email that to me. You can bring that in on a Sunday or during office hours during the week. Second step. 
Pre-registration will be required for each Sunday as we have set capacities in each of our groups. So this online registration link can be found on our front page of our website, so ccchurch.ca. It'll be found in our weekly e-bulletin that you get each Friday, and we would love for you to sign up for that if you haven't already to stay connected with our faith family. And periodically through our social media platforms. And this holds a church center app. And as a staff, we want to con continue to encourage you to use that now that we're starting things back up um, in our ministries. So that is another way that you can register for that. It's under the events tab. So I will encourage that. And then in terms of actually signing up, so registration will open one week before each of the Sundays. So that means that online registration is currently, like I mean currently open for next Sunday, September 12th. And it will work that way for each week going forward. All these logistics are wonderful, but the importance here is that as a church, we desire for the name of Jesus to be known and to be worshiped by the lips uh, of our children. And our teachers, who of course were once kids, have a passion to speak the gospel and come alongside all of our kids as they experience Jesus in our lives. So as a faith family, I need your prayers for our kids as they learn about Jesus, as we desire for them to accept Jesus and to live out the way that Jesus has for us in his word. And pray for our teachers and intercede on their behalf as they direct and discern and teach um, our kids of all ages the word of God. And I have been overwhelmed with the passion of our teachers and have seen it as a parent myself, but now as leading them, have been overwhelmed by that. So we just ask for your, your prayer and your dedicated prayer for that because we want to see the kingdom of God grow. And it does start right at the bottom. Thank you. Thanks, Laura. It's amazing. We're so excited for kids programming Sunday mornings to, uh, uh, to relaunch. First time since March of 2020. Now, if I can give just one addition to maybe your pre-planning on that. So, you, again, you've got to think ahead a little bit. You've got to register your kids each week. You're like, yes, we're going to be there on Sunday. We're letting you know this is how many grade fives you can expect, etc. cetera. Uh, it would be great if you came, like, not for the 10 o'clock service, but came for, like, the 950 service. So you can check your kids in. Remember that, remember that whole thing, right? Uh, it's been a year and a half since we've had to do that. But again, so the kids are gonna be indoors, so they'll be wearing masks um, and following public health protocols. Hopefully the adults will be outdoors uh, still, but you will have to bring your kids, you gotta check them in, all of that stuff. So if you show up at 10, you'll miss, uh, you'll miss part of, they'll, they'll miss part of the service for the kids, you'll miss part of the service, so, because we start at 10. So come to the 950 service. So that's next Sunday. Two Sundays from now is our newcomer's lunch. Three Sundays from now, September 26th, we are hoping to celebrate baptism. And we would invite you, if you have not yet done that, to uh, profess your faith in Jesus, your desire to live for his kingdom and for his glory by being baptized. There is a form on our website you can fill out to indicate your interest in that. You can talk to me or any one of the pastors and we would just love to walk with you through a very inviting, non-judgmental um, uh, process that leads up uh, to baptism so that you know what you're doing and uh, we can celebrate together with you. We would just love uh, to celebrate your baptism if you have not yet been baptized. Let's pray together as we worship. Our Father in heaven, we have gathered here because Jesus, we believe, is worthy of all glory, of all honor, of all praise, and he is worthy of being followed with our lives. We believe, Father, that Jesus Christ is Lord, and that he is the best Lord. He is a good Lord. He is the most 
uh, non-oppressive Lord. And so, Father, we welcome your presence in our, this room and in uh, the various rooms in which people are participating in worship this morning to convince us that Jesus is a good Lord. And Father, we pray uh, on behalf of our church and on behalf of our community that uh, you would allow us the privilege of living into the unity that Jesus has won for us. That, Lord, you would uh, thwart the plans of our enemy who would want to uh, deceive and divide your people. And so, Father, we pray that you would protect our unity. In the midst of a polarized culture, Father, may we be a light of, of unity across difference, that we are united uh, in, through the sacrifice of Jesus for us and through the life of Jesus for us. And so, Lord, um, make us united around uh, the right things, united around the mission that you've called us to, united around the worship of your name. And we ask for your protection over us. Father, we pray for, uh, especially for our kids this morning as they get ready to go back to school in a couple days. Uh, Father, you know that it, that's probably, a, for many of them, a pretty daunting thing, seeing as how little they've been in schools this last year and a half. And so, Father, we pray for your peace over them. We pray your protection over them. We pray your presence with them as they go to school. We pray, Lord, that you would give them a vision for, for working hard and learning well and uh, being great school citizens, uh, being a great friend, living with wisdom, living with courage, li living, Lord, according to the convictions um, that they're developing. And so, uh, Father, we pray uh, for the various schools represented in our, our community and ask, Father, for, uh, for a full and normal year of school uh, for our kids. We pray for the teachers and uh, school staff who are, um, have been busy preparing and uh, probably a little on edge as well uh, this weekend. And we pray your peace and uh, your equipping for them as well. And Father, we pray for uh, the, our ministry to indigenous peoples in this land. We pray uh, for Derek Parento and Rugged Tree Ministries in Northern Ontario. And we ask, Father, that the name of Jesus would, uh, and would spread through this ministry. Lord, that you would equip them and call them uh, to the good works you've prepared for them. And, and so, Father, we pray your presence with them and your, and your favor through this ministry. So that, so that, Jesus, you would be honored uh, among this people group. And as we worship you now, we invite your presence to lead us, to guide us, to encourage us, to correct us. In Jesus' good name we pray. Amen. Amen. I want to invite you to let's stand together as we fix our heart, hearts and our thoughts on Jesus and praise him for who he is. Oh, 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 our Lord, oh, 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 our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. Oh, oh, oh our Lord, oh, 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 our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the
this place we reach for you we cling to you oh lord oh
blessings flow praise him praise him for the wonders of his love praise god praise god from whom all blessings flow Come to the down at the foot of the cross. Jesus is waiting. God so loved the world. So, Lord, we give you praise. We just revel in the fact that Jesus loves us and he showed us your love by dying for us, by taking up our place, by dying the death we deserve to die and living the life we should have lived but now giving us resurrection. What an amazing gift. And so we praise you. We glorify you. We honor you. God, we give you our hearts again. We give you our our lives again this morning because you're worthy of our very lives. And so would you take us and mold us and shape us? Jesus the Nazarene and wonder how he could love me a sinner condemned unclean how marvelous how wonderful and my song shall ever be how marvelous how my Savior's love for me. Oh, 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 oh. He took my sins and my sorrows. He made them his very
wonderful is my Savior's love for me. Oh, we sing of your love, sing of your love. Oh, you are the perfect representation of the Father's love. So, Lord, we worship you this morning. We love to sing of your love. We know that as we look to you and we look to the beautiful example set by Jesus Christ who laid down his life for us, as we, we see Jesus and what he did and what he said, we know that we see your love for us, Father. We know that, that we, uh, we can look to Jesus and see an example of how we should love. And so, Lord, we... We receive that this morning. God, would you set our identities secure in that kind of love, a self-sacrificial love, a love that would lay down its life for others? God, fill us up again with that kind of love. Fill us with your spirit that we might understand it in a fresh way as we approach your scripture, as we approach your word again. Would you remind us of how much you love us? We pray these things. In your precious and holy name, amen. Please have a seat. Thank you guys for leading us in uh, to the presence of God. Hey, I just want to thank you for this opportunity just to share for a couple minutes. My name is Doug Hebert, in case you don't know. I just got back um, at 9 o'clock last night from Africa. And uh, travel, I'll say, is a bit daunting these days, but uh, God was gracious. I only had one five-hour delay, missed one flight in Washington and got home. Um, I had planned to go for about eight days this time uh, just to uh, catch up with our partner, see what's going on. Our colleague and fellow missionary, Travis Jose from the U.S., um, was about to go home on home leave, so we wanted to check in on him and just see how things were going after a little bit over a year of, from us leaving there, we have a new young French lady missionary who's working specifically at the school in Karababi. Want to check in with her. I was going to do a training with our D4D program. Anyways, a whole bunch of things. Everything got changed. You know, if you look up Proverbs 35 verse 2, it says, Blessed are the flexible, for they shall not snap. Look it up, Proverbs 35. So that was the name of the game. After three chain, uh, flight changes, um, Travis, our, our colleague, got really, really sick in Burundi before I left for Africa and had to get evacuated to Nairobi. So I changed my plans, went to Nairobi, and um, was taking care of him. It was determined that he, um, at 47, had had a mild stroke. He lost his balance. He no longer could walk um, without assistance. For the first while, he was using a wheelchair and... Um, as the doctors were doing more tests, he was slowly starting already to get some more um, strength back and was able to use a cane. So I was there for about a week in Nairobi, taking care of him, and then managed to get to Burundi for some days and then went back to Nairobi and then accompanied him back to the States. He was going to go on home leave anyways, and that's where he'll be getting more medical care. I know some of you have heard this story and have been praying for him, and he extends his thanks to you. And uh, ask that you continue to pray for him. Um, the doctors are giving him a prognosis of full recovery. And he does plan very insistently to go back to Africa after a few months. I just want to give you a couple quick updates about what's going on in Africa. Some um, update and also some observations. Um, first of all, greetings from Onisfor. I was able to um, have coffee with him at one point during the days in Burundi. Uh, things are going there's lots of things happening there and that he's a part of, and, um, and it's all, for the most part, very encouraging. Also from Pastor Alexi at Shama, and Shama Church sends you greetings. I was able to preach there last Sunday, and um, at the end of the second service, they had me come forward and lay hands on me and pray for me as a representative of you. And so it's important for you to know, Cornerstone, that Shama yeah, continues to pray for us as we pray for them um, pretty much every Sunday. So um, God is working there. They now have uh, four different campuses, and they're looking at, um, or not really campuses, they call them parishes, and they're looking at planting more churches. 
the school. I was really encouraged to be at the school. They've now completed a dormitory building, and this year they're going to start having some kids in the dorm, um, and which um, has so much potential uh, for good, for transformation of, of people's lives. In case you don't know, I'm talking about the country of Burundi. I don't know if I mentioned that. Some of you don't know the story. And I'd love to talk with anybody more after this service. I'm just going to give you a couple sound bites here uh, really quickly. Um, we're really excited for Orly, our, as I said, a, a young lady from France who's come to Burundi to be a teacher full-time at the school. And she's already making a huge impact there. She's, this whole week and into this next week, she's doing training with teachers so that they would be better able to teach the kids, both academically and spiritually. Another really exciting thing about the school is um, our favorite school chaplain, Meshach. Meshach, your shack, and a bit, a bunk, no. Um, Meshach is coming back to the school to be the school chaplain. And he had left, he was there for a year, and it was like, wow, this guy is dynamite. Someone who really gets discipleship. Someone who really loves kids. Someone who understands both music and sports and was drawing the kids into the heart of Jesus. He left to go study. We're like, oh, man. And people that we had after that just didn't get it the same way as, as him. So Meshach is coming back, and we're so excited about that. So pray for Meshach. Pray for the school. Um, already, Moravia Karobabi School is seen as... Second, if not the best school in the whole province, academically, but we're also seeing that God is at work and is working in the lives of the kids as he brings up servants to serve those kids. So continue to pray for that school. A couple observations, just very briefly. I would say that life in Burundi just gets harder, if you can imagine. It's already said to be one of the poorest nations in the world. COVID even though it's not really hitting Burundi, it sounds like now there's more cases that are coming, but people don't seem to be dying, um, getting sick but not dying. Um, but the way it's impacted a country like Burundi is economically, if you can imagine, even harder. So people are suffering. Food prices and other prices are increasing, and it's becoming more and more difficult for people to um, have a life. And it's, it's hard to see. We saw a number of our friends who had, you know, downgraded their house even more, who weren't sure where their, their next food was going to come or how they're going to make ends meet, how they're going to pay for their school fees for their kids. But you want to you wanna know the crazy thing is that um, the, the, the thing I'm hearing as I, as I traveled in Burundi and as, as I hear from other um, countries in Africa that we work with there's a growing sense of mission amongst people. There's a growing understanding of people wanting to answer the call of God. And I have to ask ourselves, God, what, what about us? You know, we're, we're so affluent and we have so much. And the more affluent we get, the harder it is to sacrifice. And yet I see your African brothers and sisters who are, ready, who are already suffering so much, who are ready to answer the call of God to go to dark and distant places. And you know, they're going to be awesome missionaries because they already know how to suffer. They already know to um, live a difficult life. And so I want to ask us a couple things. One is to get ready. Us, get ready, because there's going to be an invitation for us in the near future to be part of that story. Part of the story to um, enable African missionaries to go to other parts of Africa and the world to share the truth of Jesus Christ. There is a day coming. Burundi is um, a group of Christians are developing a mission agency in Burundi getting ready to send missionaries. And they're going to do their best to send missionaries, but they probably won't be able to do it all by themselves. So we're going to let them rise to the challenge, empower people, and give of their meager funds to help people. But then it's going to take people like you and me to step up to the plate and get them across the finish line to those places. So that's my invitation. And the other one is for us to consider what it means to sacrifice for the gospel ourselves. And there is an invitation as we, we sing these amazing songs and we, as we consider the truth of Jesus Christ and his call on our lives and as we believe the time is short, whether 
just in our human um, span of life or uh, in this world and all that's going on, there's a need for us to step up to the plate. One last thing. Besides it being a landlocked country, besides um, Burundi uh, not having a lot of natural resources, so many things, there's another reason why Burundi remains down. And I would tell you, it's one of these reasons is because it's a society that has lost its ability to trust one another. The level of trust in a country like Burundi is so low. And I want to speak a word to us here in the West. We're living in tumultuous times. We're living in a time of division where we can't always have the conversation. I want to give us a warning. Because if we cannot trust one another, if we cannot have the conversation, it makes life really, really hard. We have to trust. We have to be drawn to one another. This is the way of Jesus. So I just want to encourage us to be a people of trust, a people of love, a people of unity. This is the heart of God. Thank you for these minutes. Um, I would love to talk with you more at some other point. Give me a shout. Thanks. Thanks, Doug. I always love preaching after Doug uh, because even if I preach a dud, then we know a, ser- a good sermon's been preached already. So the pressure's off me today. Um, but yeah, if you're new to Cornerstone, if you're new to our uh, community or you're just kind of checking us out, uh, understanding uh, our heart for uh, the nation of Burundi would be kind of, in order to understand Cornerstone, you kind of need to understand that. And so thanks, Doug, for opening um, opening that up for us a little bit this morning. Uh, In all of my announcements about fall launch stuff, I I neglected to remind us that um, our senior youth and junior youth ministries are launching this week as well on uh, Thursday and Friday respectively, and so uh, just pay attention to announcements about that, and if you uh, don't have a family member in uh, in our uh, junior high or senior high ministry, uh, pray for those ministries. Uh, we are so thankful for the incredible uh, staff and volunteers who are leading and pouring into our kids, and we just pray God's favor on you guys and, uh, and, and trust for a really great season of ministry there as well. We are concluding this morning our summer sermon series in the book of Proverbs, God's book of wisdom uh, for us. And uh, as you can see, uh, the theme this morning is choosing a spouse. So uh, you may be thinking, I could have used that 40 years ago, Uh, but you probably got nothing to say to me today. Well, um, I want to just uh, highlight for us that uh, I hope and I pray that actually uh, there might be something here for all of us to apply today. Maybe you're already married. You've made that choice. You've chosen a spouse. You've said, I do, and you are living a married life. Maybe this morning you can hear something about how to be the kind of spouse your spouse can be glad they chose. Maybe you've never been married and you'd like to be. Or maybe you've never been married and you're quite happy that way. I pray this morning you'll learn something about the character of Jesus. Maybe you're a parent and you will have ahead of you, helping your kids, giving guidance and preparation for your kids to make this choice. Maybe you're a widow or a widower, and this morning you can thank God for the gift of your spouse. Maybe you're divorced. Maybe you're uh, trapped in a, you feel trapped in a bad marriage. Maybe this morning you can learn something in the way of wisdom. Uh, but I do want to say that uh, as, we, as we start here, that um, this is a topic that uh, will bring up uh, points of pain for many folks. And uh, if, you, uh, if what you hear this morning brings condemnation, um, brings a sense of like, 
pushing you down. I, I want you to hear that that's not the heart of God for you. That's, that's the voice of the enemy that you'd be hearing. And so I pray, I've been praying this week that my voice would be the voice of God uh, for us uh, this morning and that uh, not only God's truth but God's heart uh, would come through. I want to highlight too, there's, if you received uh, the, the, the sermon notes uh, page as you came in this morning, uh, on the top there I do have a, an important note of clarifications. Proverbs was written as uh, an instruction manual to young men. And so, therefore, on choosing the topic, uh, or on choosing a spouse, the text will speak about, you know, women and wives, choosing a woman or a wife, and not men and husbands. And uh, just a note that modern women can certainly read the Proverbs and apply them to their relationships with men and in their choice of a husband, not that men and women are identical and interchangeable, but that the qualities of a wise choice in a spouse can be applied uh, to our cultural context without all that much difficulty. And so, um, just just hear that as well as we read uh, some of these uh, texts today. Two two thoughts this morning uh, on uh, on choosing a spouse from the book of Proverbs, why it's important and how to do it, why it's important and what to look for in a spouse or how to be a great spouse. Um, So first of all, why it is important, and the first is that Proverbs, as the rest of Scripture uh, teaches, is that marriage is a covenant, a covenant We don't use that word a lot outside of church circles, uh, but it is a binding for the rest of your life agreement. A wedding ceremony is not a declaration of present love. A wedding ceremony is not two people getting in front of each other and saying, I love you right now. That's not what a wedding ceremony is. A wedding ceremony is a declaration and promise of future love. That I will love you for the rest of our lives, no matter what comes. And that's why traditional wedding vows are not, they, they totally ignore your present feelings, right? Your wedding vows, the traditional ones, not the write your own that you read about, you hear on TV shows that are say, like, you make me feel so great right now. Uh, Wedding vows are a declaration of a promise of future behavior. I will love and cherish you. I will be faithful to you. No matter what, in sickness and in health, For rich or for poor, all of those circumstances, it is a declaration, a promise of future love. Not, again, as pop culture would have us believe, a a declaration of your present feelings for your spouse. Marriage is a covenant. It's lifelong. It is till death do us part. And so it's important. Your choice. It's not one you can undo. Your spouse is meant to be your lover. Proverbs 5, 15 to 20. I'm not going to read the whole thing because it's, anyhow, you'll, you'll, you'll read it and you'll understand why. But it says, be lost in her love forever. Be lost. Be intoxicated in her love in the love of your spouse, which would have been incredibly revolutionary and countercultural in that day. In, 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 uh, in the ancient world, you didn't marry for love. You found your love elsewhere in your side people. Like, you married for status, for security. You married for your family name. You didn't marry for love. But no, be lost in, her, in, in love. A, a marriage, according to the scripture, according to the book of Proverbs, is to be characterized by love and romance, by sexual love. It's important that you choose a good one. 2.17 refers to 
a wife as, or a, and a husband and wife as the a companions, as friends. As friends. Oh, your spouse is your friend, your companion, which is incredibly, again, this unique vision for marriage. That not only are you, you know, kind of as lovers looking at each other and being intoxicated with love, like head over heels in love with them, you're also friends. And if you remember back a few weeks, I talked about friendship. Friendship's always about something, about living your life in a certain direction together. You're not only looking at each other, you're looking ahead at life together. Your life is about something together. Your wife, your husband is your best friend. This is an in- a totally unique vision, both in the ancient world and the modern world, of what marriage is. It's important to choose wisely. It's important because a bad marriage is a hard and lonely place to be. If you look at 1913, a foolish son is his father's ruin and a wife's nagging is an endless dripping. Better to live, 21.9, better to live on the corner of a roof than to share a house with a nagging wife. That's funny. Better to live in a wilderness than with a nagging and hot-tempered wife. Again, ladies, this was the Boy Scouts manual. You don't find the Girl Scouts perspective in the Boy Scouts manual. So we can apply this to men as well. A hard marriage is a lonely and difficult place to be. And a great marriage is a place for human flourishing. You see, a great marriage is way better. Young people, those of you who have not yet been married, who are, who are facing this choice in the next years of your life, a great marriage is way better than you think it is. And a bad marriage is way harder than you think it is. So what do you look for? How do you choose? How do you choose? Well, the world tells us through most of the dating apps is that you can choose based on looks and beauty, right? Swipe right, swipe left. You look for beauty. You look for a spark of attraction. You see, beauty is an incredibly powerful attractional force. And we think our culture tells us that is what is most important. He's got a great personality. Means there's not not much to look at. She's not what most people would call hot, but at least she's really nice. At least? Really? Wise people understand, as Proverbs says, charm is deceptive and beauty is fleeting. Uh, a pastor I, I really appreciate reading quite often online is a, a man named Scott Sauls out of Nashville. He says in a recent article, he said, We easily exchange substance for cosmetics, internal holiness for external hotness, godliness for eye candy, the heart for outward appearance. This world says, Are you attracted to them physically? But the scripture says, Look, beyond the external appearances because charm is deceptive and beauty is fleeting. Look instead for wisdom. Look for a person who is wise. Every 14.1, every wise woman builds her house, but a foolish one tears it down with her own hands. Or 11.22, another funny one, a beautiful woman who rejects good sense. So a beautiful woman who's foolish is like a gold ring in a pig's snout. You got to think that one through a little bit. Look for someone who is wise. Look for someone with a work ethic. Look for someone who is a good friend, not only to you, but to his or her same gendered peers. Look, do they have a quick temper? Are they quick to anger? Are they teachable? Do they plan ahead? Are they walking in wisdom? I just listed off a bunch of the topics of our wisdom series this summer. Look for someone who is demonstrating a life of wisdom. Then secondly, look at their character. 
Look at their character. 31, verse 10, 11. Who can find a wife of noble character? She is far more precious than jewels. The heart of her husband trusts in her, and he'll not lack anything good. Since marriage is a covenant that will last the rest of your life, is this a person of character who can be faithful to those promises? Have they proved themselves faithful to their word? Do they keep their promises? Look for a track record of faithfulness. Look for a track record of ethical behavior. Do they cut corners? Do they cheat on stuff? Are they humble? Do they have an honest heart? How do they do conflict? Because conflict is coming. At some point, put a couple of sinners together in a marriage, conflict will come. How do they do conflict? What is their character? And then lastly, do they have a shared vision for marriage? Can you have a shared vision about what your marriage is to be like and to be about? The classic text in Scripture on marriage is in the New Testament in Ephesians in chapter 5, where the Apostle Paul writes this. And again, this is a little bit hard on our modern ears, and I'll try to uh, not soften that, but I'll try to explain that in a, in, in a moment. It begins by saying, submit to one another in the fear of Christ. So did you hear that? Submit to one another, both ways, right, in Christ. Wives, submit to your husbands as to the Lord. So he's going to explain now how you do this mutual submission, submitting to one another. Wives, submit to your husbands. Literally says, submit yourselves to your husbands as to the Lord. Because the husband's the head of the wife as Christ is the head of the church. He is the savior of the body. Now as the church submits to Christ, so also wives are to submit to their husbands in everything. Now, that's a little hard on our ears, our modern ears. But listen, that's not the jarring part to the Ephesian church. They said, yeah, of course wives are going to submit to the husbands. The husband's the boss. That's not what I'm saying. That's what the Ephesians would have already believed. The jarring part of this passage in the ancient world in the first century was this. Husbands, love your wives just as Christ loved the church and gave himself for her, to make her holy, cleansing her with the washing of water by the word. He did this to present the church to him in splendor, without spot or wrinkle or anything like that, but holy and blameless. In the same way, husbands are to love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself, for no one ever hates his own flesh, but provides and cares for it, just as Christ does for the church, since we are members of his body." For this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and the two will become one flesh, quoting Genesis. This mystery is profound, and I'm talking about Christ and the church. To sum up, each of you is to love his wife as himself. The wife is to respect her husband. So again, this passage is talking to us about the vision for marriage of mutual submission, of submitting one to the other. That, again, to our modern ears, feels oppressive, feels Stepford Wives kind of thinking, but the jarring part, the revolutionary part is this. Husbands, you are called to willingly forfeit your rights and privileges for your wife. Husbands, you are called to love your wife like Christ loved the church. How did Christ love the church? He gave up everything for her. He died for her. He gave up everything. He lived for her. He takes care of the church. He nourishes. He lives to bless the church. He came to bless the church. Husbands, you are called to submit to your wives by giving up your rights and your privileges, you're forfeiting those to live to bless your wife, to live so your wife can flourish, to live so your wife feels honored and blessed. And wives, you're to let them do it. Have you ever heard, that's what the wives submit to yourselves to your husband. Let them love you like that. Too often that has been used, this passage has been used as a weapon against women. You, to make them submit? No, it's submit yourself. 
Submit yourselves to one another. Submit yourself to your husband. Husband, submit yourself to your wife. It's this context of mutual submission. But our instinct as entitled, aggressive jerks who are often selfish is to, is to look at marriage and say, how can my needs get met? As a consumer, how does this meet my needs instead of as a servant, how can I meet my spouse's needs? And this passage has this vision of mutual submission, of just of living life for the flourishing, for the welfare, for the blessing of the spouse. It's a sanctifying love. It's a because I'm married to you, I look more like Jesus kind of love. You encourage me to be more like Jesus. That's what this passage is saying, that, that Jesus did for the church. He, he is making the church holy. He's making her more like himself. And husbands, you're to love your wives in such a way as that happens. And so Scott Sauls asks the question, and he, said, he, nails, he boils it down to a shared vision for marriage. Does, is this, does this person who I'm considering to be my spouse, does this person motivate me towards Jesus? And secondly, do they want me, me to motivate them in the same way? Do they want me to motivate them towards Jesus? So if you are a follower of Jesus, friends, on, this rules out this rules out anyone who's not following Jesus as a potential spouse. Because Christ is your life. He is the very center of your life. He is your life. And how could you be joined together with someone who doesn't share that same center, that same vision for what life is all about? In the direction in which you're moving. that you, God is doing one thing in your life. If you're a follower of Jesus, he's doing one thing in your life. And that's making you more like Jesus. That is what everything in your life is, is flowing towards. It's for you to follow Jesus more closely. For you to have the, his heart and have his character and have his wisdom flow into your life so that you are more and more like Jesus. That's what God is doing in your life, no matter who you are. Today, that's what he's doing, and that's what he desires for you, is that you would align yourselves with his kingdom and his heart and his commands more and more and more. And so how could you join yourself with someone who doesn't share that allegiance to Jesus, that faith in him, that, that, that a trajectory of life? And so when you are considering a spouse young men and young women, do they share this vision for your potential in Christ? I see who God is making you to be and I want to join him in helping you become all that he intended for you when he made you. So that you can be safe in your incompleteness, knowing that you have a partner in this journey towards being like Jesus. That you can be safe in being fragile and being incomplete. So teenagers, of course we had you in mind as we're studying and praying and thinking through this message. Be wise, be careful in your choice. Look for someone, a young man or woman of, of wisdom and of character, but of someone who has this vision for what marriage is and will be all about. Someone who will willingly forfeit their own rights and privileges for your blessing, for your flourishing. And are you willing to do the same for them? See, the, the call here, just as much as it is a call to be wise and discerning in your selection, it's also a call to be that kind of person yourself, to be someone devoted to Jesus so that his vision for life becomes your vision for life. So his vision for marriage becomes your vision for marriage. For the trajectory that he would have for you becomes the trajectory that you walk in all the days of your life. And so would you pray with me? Father in heaven, thank you for your word that's so practical. 
that's so honest with us. And so, Father, uh, we, we recognize, at least I recognize uh, so clearly, as we see this ideal vision that you have for husbands and wives, how so often I fail in that, to live into that vision, to live up to that vision. And so I'm thankful, Jesus, that you're, uh, you're still doing a work in us, that you're not finished with us, and that you will complete the good work you've started in us. And, uh, and Father, we, uh, as a church, pray uh, blessing and favor over especially the teenagers and young people of our church and others, Lord, who would be... Uh, who are, who are still single and yet and would desire marriage, Lord, we pray uh, for, for many uh, beautiful, godly marriages to emerge among them, that you would give them wisdom, give them discernment, give them wise counselors in this. Uh, and so we ask for your leading. We ask, I pray for husbands and wives, Lord, in the hearing of my voice, that, that you would uh, refresh in us this vision of marriage, of laying down our very lives for our spouses, to love them, and to mutually submit to one another. And so that, Lord, marriages would be healed, that marriages would be restored, that where there's been pain and brokenness and hurt and unfaithfulness, Lord, that, that there would be a restoration and healing and renewed joy and peace and flourishing. For it's in Jesus' good name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thanks, Kevin. Let's stand together and respond to the word this morning.
reaching out for us, the everlasting one, Jesus our God. Sing that again, beyond the skies. Beyond the skies above, love reaching out for us, the everlasting one, Jesus our God. Sing it out, oh, we love Oh, we look to the sun, set our eyes on the Savior, see the image of love, we sing His praises forever. Oh, we look to the sun, set our eyes on our Savior, see the image of love. Praises forever. Oh, we look to the sun. Yeah. We fix our eyes on you. Oh, we look to the sun. Oh, we fix our thoughts on you. Oh, we look to the sun. Yeah, we build our lives on you. Oh, we look to the sun. Amen. Be blessed this week. Keep your thoughts and your eyes and your heart focused on who Jesus is and his love. He is the exact representation of the Father. What a beautiful promise for us. And so this week, keep focused on him in all that you do and keep asking the Spirit to fill you with his love. And we bless you. We'll see you next weekend. Have a great week.